very much, Sarah, uh, for that uh, generous introduction. And um, it is my great pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon, or almost this afternoon in one minute's time. Um, so huge thank you to um, Jessica and to Cleo and to Catherine for inviting me to um, speak a little bit about the National Sculpture Factory as part of this uh, Maud Cotter uh, study morning. And as you can see in my backdrop here, I hope you can see that I am actually live in the Sculpture Factory this morning. So I'm positioned in the mezzanine space, uh, which is, um, you'll see it in some of my images as we, as we move along. On behalf of everybody in the Sculpture Factory, we offer huge congratulations to Maud on the successful launch of the exhibition. I think we were all waiting with uh, bated breath with the lockdowns and all the things that kind of uh, came into play with the, the realization of this particular project. And so we're just so thrilled that it, it, it is here, it is now. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, I just have to go to on the beginning. So here we are in the National Sculpture Factory. I say this morning's um, presentations and uh, papers have been absolutely fascinating and have given a uh, very insightful um, perspective on Maud's practice. And I'm probably going to take a slightly different uh, track here in, in this presentation um, <clears throat> because I'm going to talk uh, specifically about the National Sculpture Factory. And as Sarah mentioned in her introduction at the very start of the morning, and it's been alluded to a number of times since, um, without Maud Cotter and the other co-founders, there would be no National Sculpture Factory. And I think the importance of an organization like the National Sculpture Factory cannot be underestimated in the uh, development of the expanded field of sculpture within uh, Cork and within Ireland, and, and, and as a place where artists can come to to think, to dream, to realize uh, ambitious projects. Um, so we'll start at the beginning um, and I'll just talk you quickly through the actual space itself. So here's an external view of the National Sculpture Factory taken um, last winter when we were in lockdown. Um, and it is, you can see it's a red brick building. It was formerly a tram depot. Um, at one point Cork had electric trams. <clears throat> I think it was the fifth city in Europe to actually have electric trams. It was very progressive at that point. Um, and very sadly, at some point, a decision was made that uh, cars were the way forward and the trams were decommissioned from Cork. But this building is a Victorian building. You can see it has a sister warehouse running parallel to it. Um, and it had fallen into disuse uh, by 1989. Uh, it had been a tram depot and then it had been an ESB substation uh, subsequent to that. And at the time when Maud and the other co-founders of the National Sculpture Factory, who are uh, Vivian, uh, uh, Vivian Roach, Ailish O'Connell and Danny McCarthy, when they came out of the what was then the, the Crawford College of Art and Design, now MTU Crawford College of Art and Design, um, with a desire to continue making work of ambition and work of scale. And there was a realization that there was no space where that could actually happen for uh, emerging artists or established artists at that point, unless you had access to a space of your own. And so Maud and the other co-founders began looking around at uh, potential suitable locations. And I think we are at that point, we are, we are located actually at the uh, edge of the docklands of Cork City. Cork, of course, it had a great uh, tradition of shipbuilding and a very busy uh, port and dock in, in previous times. All of that had sort of fallen into uh, disarray, disuse, and they were probably at that stage, although I wasn't in Cork at that point, but I would imagine from my early years here, there were a number of empty warehouses around this locale at that time. But we are really grateful that uh, Maud and the other founding members settled upon this particular warehouse. Um, it is a very handsome building. Um, it's located very close to the, uh, as I said, to the docklands, to the train station, to the city centre and to the airport, making it a really uh, a, a vital hub of activity within the actual city centre itself. Um, and so I think one of the things to note here is the amazing, wonderful ambition of the founders when they began this organization of giving it the title of National Sculpture Factory. This was in 1989 in Cork, and I think to make that bold claim for an emerging um, artist-led initiative at that point went on to have huge significance for the development of the organization um, as it grew over the subsequent years. 
So that's the outside of the building and I'm going to show you what it looks like on the inside. So here we are um, inside the space. And I think what's, um, you know, it, it, it's a very large airy space. Um, I think that sense of scale allows artists to really think with um, clarity and, and great ambition, no matter how small or how monumental the scale of the work is that they're actually working on. Um, one of the key features I think that emerged from the uh, very origins and the beginnings of the space was that it was never going to be divided up into enclosed, closed off individual studios. And I think that's part of the real magic of what makes the uh, Sculpture Factory so absolutely unique as a place uh, for artists to come and to work and for us as a, as a team to work in is that the only division between one artist space and the other are those green curtains that you can see uh, down each side of that image um, and we call the spaces that the artists occupy bays um, and there's a sort of a code of behavior uh, a kind of an understood code of behavior that the red path that you can see down the center aisle uh, that's common space that's public space and we can move through that and the yellow lines mark the, the demarcation of where you're beginning to move into an artist space and then the gray floor that you can see uh, with the green curtains there, individual bays. Um, I think that's really important because what it's allowed for is um, a, a generosity of spirit when you come to work in the factory that you are in there with whatever other artists are occupying those spaces at any given time. And it allows for conversations to evolve organically, it allows for uh, exploration of materials to become visible to other artists and for conversations to grow and to develop out of that. Now the factory didn't always look like this, um, it was a derelict warehouse when the, when the original um, cohort of artists uh, with Maud and her, and her uh, fellow founders and uh, other artists who came in to occupy it and over the years um, the, the team in the, in the sculpture factory has initiated a number of uh, architectural interventions into the space to improve and to, um, I suppose, make a better quality of space for artists to work in. So one of those is a new roof, which has um, a lot of uh, skylights and allows for a lot of natural light, which of course is very important um, in the development of any artist's um, work. Uh, I think one of the most significant developments in the factory was the creation of what we call, it's officially called the van and we call it the mezzanine or the mez. And you can see it straight ahead there. It's the cantilevered uh, building. It's a cantilevered room suspended across the building. Um, and I'm actually sitting in that now. So that window that you're looking at ahead, if you look at my backdrop, that's what you see when you're inside the room. So you've got that view of the whole factory floor. Um, this architectural intervention was designed by Tom de Quer in 1998 and was installed in 1999. And Tom was a young architectural graduate um, at that stage from the School of Architecture in UCD. And he was invited down to the factory to spend some time to consider um, how to create. I think what was identified was the need to have uh, a space where the artists could meet, where they could have conversations, where they could um, it was the beginning of the professionalization of uh, the work that was happening in the factory and where an, an artist could meet a potential gallerist or a commissioner or a potential buyer, whatever it was, and, and show their work in a clean space. Because of course the emphasis in the factory floor is it's not a clean space. It is a space where work happens. It is absolutely a workspace. And so I've called this talk Repository of Ideas, National Sculpture Factory Repository of Ideas. And I think when I think about the factory, I think that is the thing that I really think about is it is a space that both holds and grows and nurtures the development of ideas between people, between artists in collaborations in their own work and with the external world. Um, <clears throat> and the creation of the uh, mezzanine was really another step in uh, that direction. Um, and those uh, interventions have, um, this is a close up of it here, and actually what you can see, I think one of the things that was really attractive about this building as a, as a potential space for creating work and thinking about creating work was the fact that because it had been uh, built to withstand working on trams, it has a very deep pile uh, concrete floor, which means it's virtually indestructible. So we're not ever telling artists, be careful, don't, you know, mind the mind the floor, don't be banging things. None of that happens. It is, it is virtually indestructible. It also came with that yellow crane that you can see, that's the original gantry of the space. 
Um, and I think that was a very attractive, that was in use at the time when the artists first moved in. I think that was a very attractive prospect. It allowed them to lift and move large objects, large pieces of material very safely. Um, it's a mechanical uh, gantry and so it was decommissioned after a number of years, but you can see behind me we have a, a new, um, a more modern gantry in place. So inside you can see now where I am, I am basically sitting on one of those black chairs straight ahead um, and that is inside the, the, the mezzanine space that was designed by Tom Duquer. And the idea was to create a meeting space and our technical manager's office is here, a small kitchen for the artists and then this meeting room that, we're, that we are currently in. Um, it's designed to look like the, to be reminiscent of the, uh, a, a carriage of a tram or a train, and it looks like it is suspended or hovering uh, across the upper level of the building. Of course, keeping the space underneath free for the artist to work and not impinging too much on the space. Uh, that is our, our, our predominant focus is on and space for artists to actually physically make work. Um, so, when I was thinking about this and, and this notion of the factories being a repository of ideas and the fact that it's 32 years old and the amount of artists who have come through the space and the amount of ideas that have been uh, generated and realized within this space. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the other key features of the factory is we have a, an, an archive uh, that spans back since pretty much the origins of the, of the organization itself. And in our office space, we have this, um, little uh, library space which artists are welcome to use and it has quite an extensive archive of periodicals from, from uh, way back and it is a very popular spot for artists to come and think um, and, and to develop up ideas and we've often had uh, Maud herself sit in this space while she's been working on some of the ideas that we've seen uh, embodied throughout the, the uh, other presentations. <clears throat> so Maud's already mentioned um, uh, relationship and uh, collaboration with Clancy Moore Architects. And as Sarah said, I became director here three years ago. And when I arrived in, um, you know, into an organization that was already about 28 years old at that point, um, there was a lot to kind of get to grips with. But one of the most beautiful projects, the very first project that I had the, the pleasure of um, engaging with and, and working on uh, was this project called Karam, which was um, initiated um, by, it, was a, a, it came out of a series of conversations with uh, Maud Cotter and uh, artist Austin McQuinn. And I suppose just to give you, an, 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 I'll, I'll preface this by saying, what we're looking at here uh, is, is um, a work in progress. It's not a finished work. Um, so it is actually, I'm sharing, uh, I'm, 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 I hope I'm okay in doing this more, but I'm sharing some images of work as it is actually progressing um, live in the factory at this point in time. So the project that I came in uh, on, the, on the very early stages of was uh, <clears throat> this idea of creating a very small space within the mezzanine. So we are now inside that mezzanine that we were looking at there just a moment ago. And then this is in the, I'm going to go back to one. Uh, yes, yeah, so in, you can see the two windows and then to the left where those uh, lead clad uh, panels are, that's the space we're looking at inside the mezzanine here. And the idea behind this piece of work or the inspiration behind this piece of work is to, uh, it's inspired by the life of Irish architect David Cunningham, who was very instrumental in uh, setting up a gallery in San Francisco and offering uh, exhibitions and um, shows to Irish artists, which allowed them to have a, I suppose, a first um, footing in the American art scene or the American art world. Um, and he was enormously generous uh, in his support of artists and he collected books. Books were a big um, part of David's life. Very sadly, David died um, very, very young and uh, his, his loss uh, rippled through the, it was very much felt through the art world in Ireland um, and his family unbelievably generously offered 100 of David's books to the National Sculpture Factory. Um, as a reference um, for other artists uh, to, to, to research from. And they made the offer through uh, Maud and Austin, who were close personal friends of David's. And as is typical with everything with Maud and Austin, they took a long time to consider what would be the best treatment? How could we 
give those books the due respect and also create something generative, something that would be positive, something that would have uh, ripples and repercussions into the future for artists who would encounter those books within the sculpture factory. And through a series of conversations with Clancy Moore Architects, um, this idea, we invited uh, Clancy Moore uh, to come down and spend some time in the sculpture factory and to come up with a, an idea of how we might um, house or uh, commemorate these books in some way. And this is what the proposition was. Uh, the, the title of the piece is called Karam, which is a, a word that a, I think it comes from billiards. So you can correct me if I'm wrong on this mode, but it means to strike and rebound. And I think that notion of the reverberations and the rebounding of this generosity and of this um, supportive environment that David had created around the artists uh, that he had worked with was something that we were all very keen to kind of explore. And so in essence, it's a, uh, it's a freestanding, um, contained, very tiny library or reading room or a little pod. It's made of uh, perforated aluminium. And it is, I think, in consideration of where it is positioned and how it is uh, uh, installed, it's all folded. It's created through a series of folded panels. And on the left and on the right, um, there, are door, there are doors in the center that open. And on the left and the right, there will be a desk on the left-hand side and then uh, bookshelves on the, on the uh, right, as you can see. And the doors can open and close in three configurations. So you can have, them, you can have the, the desk and the little uh, bookshelf completely closed off as they are there with the window uh, in full view of the mezzanine looking back out onto the street. Um, there's a close up of that and you can see all the folded panels um, underneath um, and book, forming both the ceiling and the um, floor of the space and they are the bookshelves. Um, so the idea is that um, we will house uh, this, this is, this is the actual form of it, but it needs to go to be sandblasted and then there will be a bespoke window seat um, going into the center panel and, uh, and, a, and a beautiful chair and it'll be a space where artists can come and spend time, they can think, they can close over the screens, they're still visible, it's 10%, um, it, it's 10 mil perforation, so it's got 50% transparency, so it doesn't block out the light. Um, and then the idea is that over time that we will invite other thinkers, artists, uh, people of, um, you know, who have engaged with the factory that the factory would like to engage with to nominate maybe books that are uh, have been important to the development of their own practice or their own creative careers. So it will become, I suppose, the repository or the, the building of a creative, uh, collective creative mind. And we're hopeful that it will be um, of enormous value and, um, and, and would be much beloved by the artists who come and um, work here with us in the factory. The factory's always been very aware of um, the ideas um, of the artists who have come to work with us and of the range uh, of activity that has happened in the building over the, the, the 32 years of its existence. And we have had artists in residence or practitioners in residence who don't necessarily come from a visual art background. And in fact, one of those was uh, Dr. Eve Olney, who um, is um, uh, an anthropologist and architect and is very interested in the notions of archive and her project here with the National Sculpture Factory was to view the factory and its collective history as an embodied archive, all of the activity, all of the work that's been generated here over those years, that it leaves a resonance. I think Maud illustrated that so beautifully in some of her photographs where the layering, the palimpsest of the, the, the drawings that Maud made on the floor, that indestructible floor, um, and then the next piece of work developing over that. And if you can imagine that extrapolated by all the artists who've worked here over the years and all those kind of imprints and memories, it's a really beautiful thing to think about. Um, so the things that we're really interested in the factory is around, um, and, and, and Maud really encapsulates this, is around um, material exploration. That is what we are here to do, is to provide space and time um, and the means for artists to do that. And then we like to expand that outwards um, and engage with uh, uh, practitioners from other disciplines. Um, these are just a couple of uh, photographs um, of 
a module where we work with the MA students from the Cork Centre of Architecture Edu Architectural Education here in Cork. Um, this grew out of, uh, I think, in the very early stages of it out of necessity when the, the School of Architecture or the CCAE was housed in temporary accommodation while they were waiting for their building and the workshop space was not um, brilliantly provided for in their own building and they began coming into the sculpture factory to uh, enable their students to start working physically with materials. Of course, now they have their absolutely beautiful bespoke building. And so that need had kind of been eradicated because they have wonderful workshops in their own building. So we began to treat it differently. And this last workshop was, of course, before lockdown. We haven't been able to uh, continue this uh, until we uh, get back into the situation where we can have people in for workshops again. Um, but this was the first of a new uh, expansion of this program. It forms part of the module, one of the modules for the uh, MA. And we devised a program uh, that was led by um, artists Linda Quinlan and Alex Pentec to explore materiality. So the architecture students uh, came into the factory and they worked across a wide range of materials over a period of time. So they're extruding clay, they're making, they're casting, they cast latex, they cast rubber. Um, and we do this, I'm just using this as one example, but we work with um, students from UCC, we've had robotics students in, and I think that kind of interdiscipline, interdiscipline exploration is vital to the NSF. I think it is actually the lifeblood of what happens here in the NSF is ideas that spiral out of this or that grow out of this uh, go on to create um, amazing projects. Some of the other work that we do um, we use the space which is super flexible uh, to showcase work um, and we have uh, partnerships that we have formed with other organizations both nationally and here in Cork and one in particular is the Cork International Film Festival. So this is we collaborate with them each year and we show work by artists who work with uh, moving image or film and in our last iteration of this that was a physical iteration in 2019 uh, we worked with artist Irish artist Duran O'Malley who's based in Berlin and of course the Hulane showed Duran's work um, in 2018 this exact work um, I think that we are a sculpture factory and what we always try to bring to these projects is an additional element that uh, gives a nuance to the installation or to the uh, experience of the work that can't necessarily be found so readily in, um, in, a, in a gallery setting. Because I suppose our two spaces are very different in their intent and in their purpose from a space where art is conceived and made and then a space where art is shown and mediated uh, with the public. So here we showed uh, Duran's work on three screens and the added element that we brought to it was we we created these um this this seating um almost like a tiny amphitheater but mirroring the the formation of the three screens so when the public were sitting um inside you almost felt that you were um, encased within the installation itself as you can see the, the factory floor itself has been cleared back in certain areas and artists have had their studios disrupted to do this so we only ever show this type of work for about three nights or three days um, and this is what the um, actual installation of, uh, of Duran's work looked like uh, in, the, in the space. So you can see that the, the industrial architectural setting really adds a, a certain element to uh, this work. And this was the opening night when we could have people gathering in numbers like this and sitting squished up together on a beautiful seating. Um, so as I mentioned, we have had a uh, practitioners from other disciplines come on residency and spend time um, investigating and exploring uh, what happens in the factory. Um, I mentioned Dr. Eve Olney as one of them, but the most recent artist who spent uh, time with us was Peter Power. Uh, Peter is a, um, a composer, a sound designer, um, an artist and a, a wonderful uh, inventor of collaborations. Um, and he spent about three years on and off in the factory um, coming from very different discipline, but really, really engaged and curious and interested in about the physicality of what happens in a place like the factory. And as his time with us drew towards an end, Peter came to us with an idea that he wanted to transform the factory into completely different space using sound and light and projection. And so we worked with the Court Midsummer Festival uh, to actually create what was a midwinter festival. So we showcased this in December of 2019. Um, and this uh, Sparsile Collective is Peter's collective where he works with a range of other um, artists and um, 
and uh, practitioners of other disciplines. So Peter worked on this project. This is the sculpture factory transformed into an, a, a different space altogether. He worked with sculptor uh, Sophie Goff to create these sculptural elements that you can see here uh, illuminated in purple. And um, it was a series of uh, light um, installations that, and uh, Ashling Ennis, who uh, played uh, the harp here, this is the mezzanine again, so you can see how uh, multifunctional the space is. And we had audience, it was a promenade PC, you came in at the back of the building, and then you moved through the space, which was um, illuminated and, and animated by these incredible uh, sound installation uh, by Peter and projections by Dave Mahuna and lighting by Sarah Jane Shields. So this was on for three nights in December 2019. The run through that I was going to just show you was the final and uh, one of the most recent projects that we worked on, which came in lockdown um, when we had to close down the factory and artists were not able to come in and work. And I know Maud was certainly affected by that in the run up to this um, enormous show. Um, but we, we decided to try and find a way to animate uh, and to um, I suppose, showcase or to illuminate what was happening. And we commissioned writer and artist Sarah Baum to create a neon commission, which went onto the outside of the building. And Sarah was very kind to allow us to use um, an excerpt from a piece of writing that she was working on during lockdown, which really reflected her thoughts around what was happening at that time. And so we installed it on the 21st of June, which is this photo here with Sarah and her beautiful dog. And we ran it until the 21st of December. Um, there's a close up of it. And we, this was an opening, this is what it looked like in um, 2020, very different to the previous gatherings on the factory floor. And we commissioned a publication with Unthink and very kindly Sarah Kelleher created, we commissioned Sarah to write the absolutely beautiful text that is a, a reflection on Sarah Baum's installation. And we're delighted to say that this publication has been um, nominated and accepted into the 100 archive, which is the 100 best design projects in Ireland in 2020. So it's a scroll in a piece of neon. And this project just launched on the 21st of June. Uh, we commissioned a second neon project and we're working with artist Emo Walsh. And on the front of the building, over the front door, we have a, a neon and white neon, a sign in white neon saying the land for the people. And of course, Emer is um, inspired and uh, very interested in the notions of land ownership and the effects of the land commission still to this day on uh, the ability for young people or any people to be able to purchase a house or to have a piece of land and how that affects us all. Um, here's an installation shot and um, and there's a beautiful publication to go with this as well, which the National Sculpture Factory commissioned, which we just launched last week. So that's a very quick run through of the types of activities. And I suppose the legacy of that idea that an artist like Maud and her co-founders had 32 years ago to create a space for artists to be able to make work. And we're still seeing the wonderful effects of that today.